today's podcast, we're going to focus on how language can reveal and accelerate the cognitive process. And a guy who thinks about the game and how all those things work is joining me again here on the podcast. This is, has to be, I don't know, maybe six or, or seven. We've had a lot of these, but uh, Dub Maddox, always great to have you here. And uh, I'm really excited to talk about this in your new book, Capology. Thanks, King, for having me on. It's great to reconnect again. So, Dub, the last time we talked was right at the beginning of the shutdown, and you know, people have used that time in different ways. Uh, some just studying anything they could get their hands on, some going on deep dive into some different things. And for you, uh, as always, you go down the rabbit hole on an idea and really look at it from all angles. And uh, as we talked about on our last podcast, you, you really look like to look outside football for different answers and different ideas as well. How much did that come into play as you started to research this idea? Yeah, it was uh, really a unique time, really in history, um, when the shutdown hit because, you know, we had more free time than ever before. And I'm, I'm like everybody else. I mean, there's so many Zoom clinics and, and just there's an overabundance of football knowledge out there. And so I was I was caught up in all those um, watching and consuming um, all this football information. And I really kind of caught myself and thought, you know, this is really a, a great time that I would never have to really look at something different and, and really do a deep dive into research on some things I've had, you know, the passion to look, uh, you know, in a deeper way for quite some time. And so I, I did a, a big study in, in to linguistics and then also into vision and the science of vision and strategies there um, in other realms and seeing how that applies to the, the football posi- um, positions in football and specifically the quarterback and coach lens, um, but really all positions. And, and some of the, the things that um, I discovered were so impacting for me. Um, I, I felt it was a great opportunity to write about it because I, I learned when I write. And, and so um, as a result, um, we just released Capology uh, two weeks ago and it's had um, a lot of success early and excited about talking that with you today. Yeah, absolutely. And I agree with you. The process of writing always uh, forces you to to think about what you do, um, to ask why more often when you're writing about it to teach somebody. Uh, You certainly start asking why. Why is this true? And, you know, as you mentioned, this time we just went through um, an incredible amount of of football knowledge. I think in in the clinics I ran, there were like over 800 talks, right? Like just an incredible amount of knowledge coming at you. And when you talk about the structure of it, so many different structures too, and how people term things. There is no universal language of football, and therefore people have come at it at all kinds of different angles. And ultimately, I feel like if you can be very precise on how you structure things and structure your language, especially for the purposes of teaching, communicating, providing feedback, and then being able to make decisions, I think you can gain an advantage. But it's uh, for some people, I think it gets lost in. Um, this quest for more and more and more knowledge, and you end up being a, a mile wide, but maybe an inch deep. And you've taken the opposite approach. You went a mile deep into this idea. Yeah, you know, really, it started with a story for me. I ran in my research along a story about this uh, Moke, this tribe um, off the coast of Indonesia, and they're called the Mokan. And in 2004, a tsunami, um, you may remember this. Um, really uh, wreaked havoc on, on all of that area in, in that Indonesian area um, off off the coast. And I think 250,000 people were killed in that giant tsunami. So imagine yourself on one of those resorts that day on the beach and you're sitting there drinking a cocktail and all of a sudden you see this giant wave and you know, get your phone out to take a picture of it. And then the wave gets closer and closer. And pretty soon you're like, well, uh, this is probably not safe, but I really want to see this, you know, fantastic feat. And before you know it, the wave you know, crashes on shore and, and, and you're dead. And that was the, the reality for, like I said, you know, a quarter of a million people that day. There was a, there was a tiny tribe off, off that um, coastline that was right in the path of that tsunami. And in that tribal culture there on the island and off the island, because they live, they're, they're fishermen and, and they live in the water there. No one died, not one person. So you have something, you know, really unique there in that environment. What allowed this small culture of, you know, a couple hundred people to survive this, you know, great disaster where, you know, normal people in today's modern age with all kinds of radar technology or tsunami detection bias, evacuation plans, they, they couldn't escape the, the deadly path of this, of this wave. And what, what happened was, is when they went and they 
kind of researched how they were able to survive, there was a photographer on the island documenting Moke and life that day. And she was there to um, just kind of document, take pictures. And because they're a really, you know, remote village there on that island, they have a unique language that's uh, only, you know, for that culture. And what they found was, is that this tribe are experts in tsunami detection, right? They understand the little patterns that we as, you know, in, a, in our modern society don't understand, even with the great technology we have and satellites and all those things. And so just for thousands of years, they developed a language to identify those key components that reveal a, an oncoming tsunami. And so I thought about, you know, from, from the quarterback lens or a coach lens, expert quarterbacks, expert coaches, how are they able to anticipate, you know, space coming open or anticipate, you know, better decisions than other people? And it's really the ability to identify things that normal people can't see, but it's the, the key is the language. And, and that's the, the, the kind of, you know, analogy that I use to open the book and really what allowed me to dive deep into linguistics, linguistic coding, and also vision strategies, because you have to know what to look for and you have to be able to teach that. And so that was the impetus of the book. And that's really um, kind of what started that. And so this book is really about how to um, teach expert spatial awareness, how to have a language that can communicate time, because time is very critical in football. You have to have an understanding of how much time you have um, in the schemes that you call. Your players have to understand the timeline. And then how to process talent. How do you process post-snap movement? And so there's really three layers of language that you need to be able to live in this football environment because the environment is constrained by space, time, and talent. So we need a language for each category, and that's what the CAP is. CAP stands for Coverage, Alignment, and Personnel. And there's a language structure for each, and that's how we teach our players and communicate and teach them what to look at and how to identify all these components. And for you, this is something that has evolved. I mean, you, you really started to look at language a, a long time ago when you, you – you guys came up with the R4 language and really started to put a process to how you think about the game, how you think about decision making, how you you know integrate time into that as well, because all of it was really cal- calibrated on a certain timing. Um, and looking at the li- linguistic coding now and going deeper into this, uh, what what advantages do you see for the coach who? You know, learns from something like this, and I think you've always kind of put things together in, in the way that it, it really becomes an operating system for things you already do. You don't have to necessarily change everything, but you're adding a layer to it with these different things. So advantages of, of learning from what you've done here with linguistic coding for football. Yeah, basically it's, it's the ability to hold a player's hand or to um, – take that coach on your staff that might be a novice or a rookie coach and distill all this complex information that, that you kind of learn through osmosis and learn through experience. How how do I take all that expert knowledge that I've accumulated with years of coaching and unpack that and distill all the impurities out, all the noise out and teach my players and coaches um, that haven't had as much experience as me, what matters most? How do we eliminate the noise? Right. And then how do we um, have a, quick language, and we call this language um, something specific. It's brevity codes, and that's what the military uses. So mm-hmm. um, these brevity codes are small words that say a lot with a little, and that's the environment I think we have to live in. You know, I had a friend that was in the special forces, and, and I talked to him a, a lot, and um, he gave me some fascinating stories about just the football world and his his comparison to the special ops world, and, their, and he talked about their meetings, and he's like, you know, if the special forces teams would set in some of our football meetings. um, They would be shaking their heads and and just thinking, you know, what are you doing? The the way you communicate, the way you talk um, does not, does does not have a symbiotic race relationship with, with the environment that you live within. You know, you're playing and operating in a sub second environment and that's what the special forces are operating in. And you have, you kind of have an idea of what's going to happen post snap, but you really don't have a hundred percent certainty of really what's going to happen. The same way when the special forces go into a room that's taken over with a hostage, you have kind of idea how many people are in there and where that guy's at and what weapons he has, but you really have no idea until you breach the door. So you have to have a brevity code language, a system that's fluid that can communicate adaptive strategies as you enter in through there. And that's the same that we have to have as coaches and, and some of the biggest mistakes I made early on as a coach and 
and, and even with my players is, you know, being in the games, pressure's packed, you know, how do we communicate the reality of what's happening post-snap in, in, a, in that sub-second world quickly um, so we can make fixes faster and adapt quicker? And, and so that's really what capology allows you to do. It allows you to communicate dominant positions of defenders, right, the post-snap alignments of body positions that, that reveal the anticipative action, and then also a language that can measure the closure rate or the speed of defenders. And so when you have a language and a system that can, um, in a brevity code system, that's really one simple word that says a lot with a little, you can now make rapid adjustments really quick with you and your players and, and see space through the same lens. And I think that's when you, when you can achieve that, it, the game becomes really fun because you're empowering your players and your team to, to network and think as one. And I think that's what every coach's goal is. It just allows you to do it faster. So in looking at what you've done with Brevity Code, I know you focused on three different types of, of coaching language, spatial, temporal, and locomotive. Could you, first of all, give us a description of, of what each of those is, especially as it's applied to football, and maybe uh, something that gives us a, uh, a, a tangible example here on the podcast. I know we don't have anything to draw on the board, but uh, yeah. just going through it, you know, with language, I guess that's appropriate. Yeah. So, so I think the whole deal is like, if you got to, you know, I'll just take you through a day one kind of install with our players. It's the ultimate goal here, right. Is to make this really simple, but you have to start out and you have to build your ABCs essentially to put words and sentences together and so the idea here is to, okay, what's my process that I'm going to use to get my players to look at a picture really quick and see the pattern and us to see that pattern the same. So what's the ultimate goal in football? The ultimate goal for the offense is to uncap space. The, the goal for the defense is to cap space. And whoever does that better usually wins the game, right? So we as an offense need to identify uncapped space. And really it's not just, seeing it as it as it happens it's the anticipate it's the anticipation of that space happening but actually before it happens and that's what this process does so how do we do it well we need frames of reference I mean, that's the first thing right mm -hmm. so we have to have frames of reference in space that are anchored that that allow us to process movement from the same lens so the interesting thing is is that there's native cultures in in the world that have supernatural ability to basically find find things like i mean directions and finding locations um they could be in a room that has no windows and they can perceive what where, where, what north is where south is where east where, where west they they have the ability because they're always in that culture orienting to true polar north so they have a constant frame of reference in their language they use cardinal directions which means they use north south east and west in how they talk and how they perceive space where we don't really as, as humans use cardinal directions we use egocentric so i say if, hey where's the tree you know and if we're outside in the woods i say hey where's the big oak tree you might say well it's in front of me and it, but if you turn 90 degrees you know the other way now that that same tree might be to the left of you does that make sense yeah. so so we use we talk and communicate in egocentric directions so those directions are going to change based on where our body's position and so it becomes confusing we're not seeing space with the same lens we use egocentric directions and I think a lot of times us as coaches we use egocentric coaching language you know we're coaching you know that post was open from our lens but we don't have frames of reference that we're operating from the same as our quarterbacks operate from because we haven't established those well if we were in a native culture for example the aborigines in Australia they all operate from true polar north so if you ask a group of aborigines a group of six-year-old aborigines where north is every one of those six-year-olds would immediately port to true polar north they would instinctually know because that is built into their language that's how they communicate they actually greet each other um hello and then when they greet each other they actually have a uh, part of their greeting is establishing the direction of where they are and where they're facing it, it's it's really fascinating because they have to be able to to move and and communicate really quickly into all kinds of you know uh, they don't they don't have street names and things like that in their environment so again bringing it back uh, um, to football here, how do we uh, how do we take that concept? We have to establish frames of reference. So our frame of reference is the hard deck. That's our true polar north essentially. So hard deck allows us to establish vertical space from horizontal flat space. Okay, so that's that's our horizontal frame. That's essentially our x axis uh, on a grid. And then the vertical axis is the vertical stem of the route 
based on where the receiver's at. So let's say that we have a slot receiver lined up to the right of a two by two formation, and he's just running a corner route. All right. So the first thing that our players need to understand and as coaches is the space that that corner route attacks. So we have to have a language to describe, okay, where's the space that this corner attacks? Well, there's four directional spaces that corner can attack based on the horizontal hard deck frame of reference and the vertical route stem of the corner. Okay, so what's our brevity code? That, that space, that, that receiver can attack over or under the hard deck. That's the vertical uh, language for the vertical space. So over and under are our brevity code words that we use to describe vertical space in relation to that hard deck line. Okay, the next two frames of reference for space are inside and outside. That's the brevity codes we use to describe horizontal space in relation to the vertical stem of the route. So there's four directions, essentially like a north, east, south, east, west from a cardinal direction that the aborigines use. They're in the football world, it's over, under, inside, or outside. So now I ask my players, okay, now that you understand the frames of reference, tell me in two words the space of the corner attacks. And they all should say it attacks over and outside. Right. So now mm-hmm. in, in, in just one you know, quick five minute explanation, I can get 30 receivers and quarterbacks in the room if I was teaching that many to all be able to communicate. OK, the space, the route side space of that corner is designed to attack. And that's kind of where we start. Now, we're not going to do that three weeks from now, but that's the initial entry point into getting everybody to see space the same. All right. So now if let's say we're running a post route and I ask everybody in the room, guys, what space is the post route designed to attack? They should say over and inside. Okay. Very simple concept, right? Right. Okay. Now we put a safety out there. So let's put a free safety. Okay. In space. And now I want the players to tell me the dominant position of that safety. And they should say, based on where he's at, so let's say the safety is over the hard deck and lined up inside the vertical stem of the receiver. So they should say he's over and inside. So now the next layer, I would say, okay, now guys, okay. Is the corner open? Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Based on where the safety is, the safety's over inside. The corner attacks over and outside. Is is the corner out open? They all should say yes. But some of them aren't very confident. I mean, it's a, it's surprising how many players can't really describe and, and verbalize what open is and what it looks like. Right. So if they did not understand that, I would say, okay, the safety is over and inside. The corner attacks over and outside. Those spaces don't match. So that is actually an uncapped space. Okay. Then I I pull up another slide. Now the safety is over and outside. So, so that same safety moved over and outside, the corner tax over and outside, that's capped. That's the first basic spatial understanding that they have to have. You know, is a player in, in the way of the route side space? Well, it's easy to look at that and say yes or no, but to have the language that explains that has cognitive, like neural, uh, um, there, there's science behind the engraving of that, that neural network there by having the language, the language allows them to see that pattern faster and, and to collect and bring everybody the same. And it allows you as a coach to coach it if they can't just see it naturally or understand it naturally. So that's really the first layer is just describing dominant positions of defenders in relation to the route side space of the route. The next phase of that is the A and cap. That's the angle of the hips. This is where we get into the temporal language and how we predict the space that that defender can move over time. So there's four hip angle positions a defender can be in. So let's go back to that original picture that we just communicated. So let's take the corner that breaks over and outside and the safety is over and inside. Okay. And so now I'm going to say, okay, players, here's the picture is the corner route capped or uncapped. They should say that that route is uncapped because the corner attacks over and outside safety is over and inside. And I say, okay, now on the drop, as you drop back, let's say you're on your second to last step, your drop. Okay. And let's say now the safety um, hip angle, right, is square to the line of scrimmage, okay, square. So is, so what, what does that tell us? That tells us at that moment in time, that safety can only close on anything horizontally in front of him. His hip angle tells us the linear path he can move at that moment in time. So that's a temporal code that confirms if that corner route is, in fact, still capped or uncapped. Because if the safety has a hip angle that's in the direction of the route side space, now, if his closure ability is greater than the receiver, now that route can become capped. So this is a language process that can now allow us to code the patterns of hip angles, and those codes reveal the reality of the space that he can move in a direction over time. So let's say that the safety is over and outside capping the post. 
And then on the snap, the safety has a full hip angle. That means the hips are fully turned downfield. And a full hip angle is our brevity code, communicates the safety's position to close on vertical space. So if I'm a safety and I'm over and outside, I've capped the route by my dominant position. If my hips are fully turned, I can now close on vertical space. So that is a deeper confirmation that route is capped. So that hip angle is an accelerator for the quarterback to get off that route faster or to maybe hang on to it if his hips were square. Mm -hmm. So just because the defender's in the way doesn't necessarily mean the route is capped. That's the biggest thing that quarterbacks have to learn. It's the, the angle of the hips is the second deeper layer of that open onion, if, if we're talking about the layers of the onion peeling it back. Right. And so once you can establish those hip angle brevity codes and your players can understand, we've talked about the, the square, the full, a man hip angles when that hips are turned to the sideline. And so the eyes of the defender are on receivers when that happens. So again, he can close on outside space. So if it's an outside breaking route, we got to be cautious about throwing that. If it's an inside um, hip angle position, we call that a zone hip angle. The eyes of the defender are on the quarterback in those situations. So we have to be very careful about throwing, you know, balls in against zone coverage because they can close on it faster because they can see the release of the ball. So there's all kinds of information that we pack onto these brevity codes and it allows us to accelerate our anticipation and it really allows us as coaches on a Saturday afternoon as we're going through the film with our players have a language to correct mistakes faster. And so I think that's the power uh, of the cap. And the, in the final, the, the final letter in cap is P for personnel. That's the closure ability of players. And so you have to be able to measure as coaches, right, the talent level of a defender and his ability to overcorrect a bad dominant position or hip angle. And so we have metrics that we use. And I talk about some really advanced ones in the book um, that you can, that we've kind of built even out even further to basically know before you go into a game if a route's in fact going to be capped or uncapped. So one of those would be like the, the quick out. So you, you talk about like working like a, a quick out from a slot receiver. You know, there's a lot of times that I'll watch a game after a Friday night and that linebacker that's apexed right there, you know, looks like he's in a dominant position to really cap that flat space. Right. And I, I'm watching the film and he even has a hip angle that's turned in position to undercut the out route. We don't want to throw the pick six on the quick out. It's it's a scary route as a coach to call and throw because it has a, you know, a, a high reward and it's a, it's high risk sometimes. Right. But if you can measure the break rate of those defenders and you can do that off scout film. So we go into real detail on how to measure break rates of defenders and how they basically cognitively either it's like defenders are looking at the quarterback to initiate when they break or they're looking at the receiver and you can, you can basically give a, a defender a break rate grade and we grade it positive, neutral, and negative to really allow you as a coach to have more confidence to, to call that play or tell your quarterback, Hey, this is going to be uncapped in the game. So we're measuring the talent level of that player through film and it, it helps us in a game to be more confident or maybe to be more, you know, um, cautious about calling a particular route, a particular play. So you're going to get all that in the book. And, and again, I'm, uh, I'm kind of going on, but I get really excited talking about this stuff because, because there's a lot of fascinating things that I think can really help a lot of coaches. No, certainly I'm, I'm fascinated with everything you're sharing here. Um, let's, let's talk about something you just mentioned, break rate and taking a look at that. Uh, I, I know, um, and I've studied your stuff, you know, from the beginning, I have all your books. I read them often, uh, look at everything you do. So uh, I always feel like there's there's definitely a learning curve in sitting down and saying, you know, what is this stuff? How does it apply to what we do? Uh, but once you get that in, it makes things a lot easier, right? So even in something like this, wow, you know, now I got to grade something like break rate. But for you, I'm sure there's um, a sample size that starts to tell you this is the guy's break rate that you don't have to go through hundreds of clips to say this is the guy's break rate. So where's that sweet spot where you can be efficient with your time and looking at things like this and, and charting some of those things um, versus being a guy who's, who's cut up watching every aspect of film all week long and, you know, forgetting about the, the most important part, important part, teaching your players. Yeah, I think that's very important. We talk, I talk about that in the book because, you know, you can really get lost in the analytics of things, right? So it's really understanding. It's like the Moken. It's like that native tribe. It, it's what are, the, what are the things that matter most here? You know, it's really three to four things. 
And, and so, you know, you have to be selective on what you really spend your time on. So I think, you know, there's going to be games and there's going to be opponents that you're going to watch a clip of film. And, you know, closure for us is can be a really loose grade. I mean, we can grade, you know, hey, this linebacker has positive closure on all horizontal breaking routes. I mean, it can be something after you watch three clips uh, of a player you know, breaking on horizontal breaking routes, you're going to know, you know, what closure is. You can grade it positive, neutral, or negative, real simple. But there's those, those opponents that you have where that talent level is evenly matched, and those are usually the big games, particularly in the playoffs, that you – this is when these grades really, you know, are, are beneficial to you and really when you do that extra study time. So for break rate, for example, is simply what we're doing is like – I'll go back to that quick out. We're watching how that apex player um, – matches his footwork with whatever you know key he's looking at so again you know a linebacker's essentially you know i'm talking about an apex linebacker is essentially in zone coverage he's going to either look at the quarterback and he's going to his break rate begins when the quarterback breaks his hand for you know when his hands separate and then that's when the first foot is should be should be in the ground so for example a positive break rate for a player would be he is breaking he is planting his foot in the ground to redirect his vector to undercut that route, that, that break foot is in the ground before the quarterback separates his hands. So his break foot is in the ground before the quarterback breaks his hands, right? And then his drive foot, his drive foot, that's the first foot out of the break, right, is in the ground in a direction to undercut the route. So what you'll see a lot of times is linebackers, they're breaking, you know, in a proper time, but their drive foot is not on the proper vector to undercut the route. So that would be a neutral or negative break rate. Because now that it takes them two to three more steps to recover mm -hmm. to get on a proper vector to get the route. So that's kind of what you're looking for on film. If you see a linebacker that has a horrible, you know, um, um, break and drive step, I mean, they might have a good break. They might have good anticipation for the break. But their drive step doesn't align to undercut the route side space. That's a guy that you can attack with that particular route, right? And now if, they're in, if the linebacker's in man or maybe he's in zone, he's key in the man – his break rate is not off the quarterback now, it's off the break of the receiver. So if his break foot matches the breaks of the receiver, so the receiver, let's say he's on a four-step quick out, if his break foot matches the fourth step of the receiver's break and his drive foot matches the drive step of the receiver's break out of that, then that's going to be a neutral or a positive break rate. He's going, to, he's going to match the receiver's break. So you can kind of start to see that on film. And once you kind of spend time kind of grading this stuff out, it gets a lot easier. You can just – you can just watch the clip and you can start assigning the grades easier. It really, to me, it's a, it's a, it's a exercise that strengthens your coaching, you know, mental muscles to anticipate these little nuances that can confirm if space is going to be open or not. So that's kind of how we, we, we grade the break rates of defenders on some horizontal breaking routes. We do vertical as well. Um, but that's a, that's a, cha a whole chapter in the book is, is advanced closure concepts. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, I, and I used it a lot for the All-22 in the NFL. So I've, I've, I've really tested it against the All-22, against, you know, college film high school, and it, and it stands at all levels of football. And I think it's a great tool that can help coaches have, be more confident in what you're going to call and kind of know that route's going to be there before you even go into the game. I know as I go down the list of, of some of the highlights of what, what's in this book, one that really jumped out at me was the most intercepted throws in football – and how to avoid them. I know you cover, cover several, but uh, can you give us one as uh, an example of, of uh, again, what you're illustrating and explaining in the book? Yeah, so one of the things I did in the off season was I, I went through five years of study of all the interception in NFL. So I think it was like over 3,000 um, clips. And, and so, I mean, it was a, I mean, with COVID, it allowed me to do this. These are things that I would not be able to do in a normal year. And so I just I, I wanted to research. Okay, what are the most common cap looks for every route in football? And so I just did a sort, and it took, I mean, it took six months to do this. So I all the post routes for the last five years I've been intercepting in NFL, all the digs, all the drags, all the slants, all the seams. And so once you kind of group all those routes together, and you start to see that there's commonalities in the interceptions for these routes. And what what was fascinating to me was that for every route, there was about five categories. There's five families for every route that generate the most common intercepted looks. And so the thing that I think that will help coaches is it allows you to see the patterns that present a cap look for your quarterback. So it allows you to say, for example, like for the seam route, for example, the seam, the most, one of the most common intercepted cap looks for the seam is when that apex player is over and outside the slot receiver, 
So it could be like they're in cover seven and he's like playing that special where he's over and outside and his hips are turned in a zone hip angle. So now he can see the release of the quarterback um, when he releases the ball and he can undercut the route, if that makes sense. So he's in a dominant position, in a high dominant cap position to pick those off. That's one of the most common um, cap alignments for defenders that intercept seam. So what does that mean for me as a coach? For my quarterback, hey, if we're throwing four vertical or we're throwing seam read, you know, whenever you see that apex player over and outside playing with that zone hip angle, hey, we, that's capped. You know, that, that's the conversation we want to have. So now we can practice that and I can keep my quarterback out of bad positions, bad hands if we were like playing poker. Hey, this is a bad hand. You know, we, we got to fold here, if that makes sense. And, and so that was the, what you're going to get in the book is you're going to get, I think we, we go over the 10 most common intercepted throws in football and the five most common looks for each throw. That was one of my favorite chapters to write. Um, the dig was the most intercepted route in football. Um, the dig and the drag were the two most intercepted. And that was really telling for me. So if you throw the dig, if, you, if, if a dig is, is a big route in your offense, that doesn't mean you stay away from the dig. It, it means that you really need to work, you know, these five different cap looks to make sure your quarterback doesn't make the same mistakes these NFL quarterbacks are. And that's where you're going to get help in the book from. Yeah, and as you're talking about that, you really, I think, bring out an important coaching point, right? And we're talking about the dig as the example there and the, the different things you need to work. How, for you as a coach, you know, understanding this language better, understanding these concepts better, how has it helped you improve what you guys do in practice and what you spend your time on? Yeah, it's, it's really it's one of the biggest things is vision strategies. I, I am embarrassed to say I have done a horrible job coaching vision uh, for my quarterbacks. And, and, and I coach vision, but really I put my quarterbacks in some binds that I didn't understand. And there's, there's really two types of focus with vision. And so when you study expert vision strategies with, with players in other sports and, and what sets them apart is they have the unique ability to bring in their central focus and their, their peripheral focus and use it collectively together. So what I found myself doing is I would do a lot of defender key reads, you know, so we're, we're still using a cap, but we're focused on one cap. So I'm like, if we're throwing, you know, maybe that quick out, you know, I'm, I'm telling my quarterback to read that field corner. Right. And I want you to defender key him. So if you see his hip angle will have a full turn, you know, that's uncapped. If, if it's a square hip turn, that's capped, you know, and we're, and we're in, and really just that's going to, in my mind, made him make better decisions. But when you teach defender key, I, I was putting my quarterback in a cognitive tunneling pattern because I wasn't coaching his peripheral focus and how to bring in the, the apex player, how to bring in the field safety. You can really see two to three defenders if you know how to use these expert strategies. And the concept's called anchoring. And so what expert players do in other sports is they anchor their central focus instead of focus on a defender key that central focus can be is going to be anchored between the two to three most common threats to that route space and so once i started understanding the concept of anchoring and teaching my quarterback how to bring in other players into his vision i mean the acceleration of 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 anticipation and and negative decisions went down drastically and you can even try it yourself i mean you know there's still times where we'll do scout team quarterback you know maybe we don't have a, a quarterback there that day and you have to run scout team so there was a couple of years ago i was having to do scout team quarterback and i was actually trying some of this stuff and i was fascinated on how much more of the field i could see when i practiced the anchoring concept and there's some drills we talk about in the book that can help that so that's one of the things i think um that's really going to help coaches um is is learning how to coach vision better um, I took my guys out the other day and I took a GoPro handheld and we just did an e base echo drill. It's one of our base drills. And you, you, you're familiar with that drill. I mean, it's been a drill of use with R4 for years. So we're going base echo through our different progressions and I'm just video up close to the GoPro and I'm vi videoing their eyes. Mm -hmm. And I was amazed to see at how inconsistent their vision was. Their head is looking at the right place. They're saying the right routes. They're in rhythm but their eyes were making additional what we call saccades, and that is one of the enemies of the quarterback, okay? So they're, they're, a saccade is when your eyes move from one fixation to the next. Yep. Now, the, 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 the thing about the saccade is it happens very quickly, like four-tenths of a second your eyes can move, so you don't even really realize it. But in your brain, you go blind when your eyes perform a saccade. 
you, you go blind. Now you don't, you don't see a black spot in your vision because it happens so quickly, but you know, cognitively your mind shuts off for four tenths of a second. And so the more you do, the less you see, if that makes sense. So we got to be really disciplined about how many fixations we make and how to coach that. And so by videoing my quarterbacks and being able to slow that down and showing them like, you know, it's amazing how many times guys will, you know, quickly, maybe their eyes will scan to the ground or maybe scan like to the other, you know, sideline, but, but their eyes, but their heads in the right place. And so when you see these little nuances and you can make them aware of that, the vision becomes better. They have less saccades. And so now they can see space in a broader scope. Right. My understanding of it, having studied some of this too, and heard other coaches talk about it, it's, it's the difference between uh, really your eyes jumping around versus smoothly moving a, across an area to, to, uh, to see that next point in the progression. Is, it, is that how you're looking at it? Yes, w- without a doubt. And I think um, <laughs> the, the, the main thing is that you've got to make sure that the scans you're using don't exceed there's a certain yard depth when when like so I, what i found was is I, like we would start with maybe like a, a sideline boundary you know concept or route that would be kind of our rhythm route and then i'm having him come all the way across the field for like a read dig or maybe it could be a cross route or something of that nature and there's there's a capacity there in yard depth that your peripheral vision you get outside your periphery and, and so, and so what I was doing is I was making my scans too broad. And so it was actually not timing up properly with the timeline. And it was also having them to make an additional saccade to get all the way across. So I think you know, that's some of the things we talk about in the book is you have, we talk about the, the field of range your peripheral vision has. It's about 13.5 yards is your periphery. So, so you, if you get beyond that 13.5 yards, it, it then you might need to take an additional reset step in the pocket to give your quarterback time to get reset and bring everything into the play. And that's a lot of reason why the dig and the drag route is the most interceptive route in football is because the quarterbacks, they were, were getting, they weren't getting their eyes ahead of the space. They were focused on the receiver. So essentially those defenders were beyond that 13.5 range of their periphery. And so they were blind to that backside linebacker, that drop defensive end, getting in that big window and robbing it, if that makes sense, or that maybe that, that backside safety. And, and so you really need to be you know, cognizant as a coach of you know, how, how wide your routes are within your scan, and you might have to teach you know, a quarterback an extra reset step up to allow your quarterback to get his eyes over there. And that's in the interception study. One of the biggest reasons why quarterbacks throw interceptions is because they, they, they focus on the receiver instead of focusing on route side space. And I think that's the, the biggest takeaway these listeners need to understand. You've got to have an awareness and making sure your quarterback's eyes are ahead of the receiver, not on the receiver, right? You need to anchor your eyes on the route side space, bring the defender to the periphery, and it's the receiver's job to get there. If he doesn't, you go coach the receiver up better, not the quarterback. And I think you'll see that all the way up at the highest levels in the NFL. Most interceptions occur because the eyes are on the, the man instead of the space. So going back to some of your original things you've done in setting up the R4, R4 four was all calibrated on a certain amount of steps that are going to time up with where the quarterback is in his drop and, and then in his progression. So – um, you know, you, you're, you're talking about the depth perception, how it's affected that. So do you find yourself going back and looking at your concepts and even adjusting them to be able to to, to meet some of those uh, demands of how he's processing? Yeah, so so what you have to do is on some of these, we, we, were, we weren't taking the proper, we had to front load more drop time, you know, in the pocket to accommodate that extra reset in the pocket or the, the width of that scan, if that makes sense. So, and it, you know, maybe I was teaching one concept is, is like a, a intermediate concept, you know, a basic 1.8 timeline concept. Well, really that was more of a, of a, you know, seven step from under center type concept or a five step from gun. You know, maybe I need to, to, to bring that rhythm timeline at 2.2 seconds to, instead of 1.8 to accommodate the breadth, the scope of that scan. And I think that's that that's something that I really didn't pay much attention to as well um, early before we understood this stuff. And and that brings me up. So, and I, I go ahead and share it with you because I mean it's going to be out on Monday. But um, 
another big issue I had with this, you know, learning this is, you know, these different timeline patterns and, and how do we fit it all in. The other big problem I had with my quarterbacks, and this happened with COVID because we didn't get our hands on our players till August. Right. And I was at a new school, didn't get any spring or summer ball. And so it was, you know, we, we had a really slow start because there were so many things that I needed to, you know, get dialed in with my players. I needed to learn who they were. And one of the biggest things was how do I get my players to go gain speed and get the, the feeling of rhythm under pressure? And I really struggled with that because we really couldn't create that gain speed atmosphere with spring ball. So I think if you go with seven on sevens, you see the same problem. You know, quarterbacks are, are dropping and operating in an unrealistic time environment. So I, I, I wanted a tool that could help um, keep my quarterback on the proper timeline and to go game speed. So what we just developed was uh, basically a sub-second progression timer. It's, a, it's an R4 progression timer, and it's, it, we developed an iOS on Apple, and you can do it on your Apple Watch. So you can download this app now on your phone or on your watch. So your quarterback can use it on his own or use the coach can use it on the field. And it's got four phases, rhythm, rebrush, release. And it's got all the different timelines that you would use for, for any concept. So your intermediate concept, the rhythm phase at 1.8, the read phase would be four tenths of a second after that, the rush four tenths of a second after that, and then release after that. So you can press start on the snap, and as the quarterback hits each one of those timestamps, it's going to be allowed deep to inform him and you as a coach if he's on that game speed pattern and making sure that his eyes and feet are staying on the proper timeline. It's like a metronome for quarterback mechanics, if that makes sense. Yes. And, and so you know you've seen the you've seen the QBT and they have that time and you can adjust the time, but. I needed some. I needed more times, more phases, to to operate the remaining part of the progression, and to keep my quarterback moving in the pocket at game speed. And so, you know, the beauty of this timer is now, you know, if you're doing a quick game spacing concept, the timeline is going to be a little faster. It's going to be at 1.6, so that's a three-step timeline. If you're doing a bootleg, that's a you know a 2.4 second timeline. That's that's a play deep play action. Um, RPOs are a different timeline, so you need to have a phase for that. Um, I think about the Wake Forest, you know, the Wake Forest RPO game that you shared uh, yeah, a year or two ago. Right. That was fascinating. You remember that? So how hard and how long they're holding a mesh. We tried that. It was very hard for my players to learn how to just long the hole in the ball and really slow that down. So this this phase timer allows us to program the timestamps that we need to, uh, to to hold the mesh on rhythm and then when we need to pull the ball out for our read rush throw. And so that metronome can be used in a variety of, of situations you can use it for your receivers on different route breaks if you know some receivers can can run a 15 yard dig at 2.2 seconds some it takes 2.4 so this metronome timer allows us to get everybody on the same page and and allows you know kind of confirmation if they're there or not and so we're releasing that there on like i said ios next week and uh i'm really excited to see it help coaches and players and, and i think it'll be something that can be a great addendum to this book Oh, I, I love it, uh, and I know exactly what you're talking about. You know, when we learned this stuff from you, again, I can't remember exactly. I, I think I visited you around maybe 2009 and, you know, came back, and for us, everything then was on stopwatches for the quarterbacks, for the re receivers, to get that calibration, right, to really understand and get everybody on the same page. And, and you know, I've shared this before on the podcast. It would be, you know, especially our freshmen would come in, they, they thought our, our quarterbacks were freakish in some way because they, they had developed that feel for what was the timing of that throw. And they, most of them could get it within, you know, the experienced guys within a tenth of a second. Like, oh, that was, that was a 2.4. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'd pull up the stopwatch and show the freshmen, and like, how are you guys doing this? Right? But, but yeah. now when, especially for the guys learning this, you have a tool uh, like you've described. I think that's incredible, an incredible tool for – coaches to really get the passing game calibrated and um you know from the beginning this this stuff you've done and and uh you know the the way this has progressed has, has definitely made a difference in the way I've been able to coach players yeah I remember us talking about that stuff and it's really fun when the players uh, get, get the feel of that rhythm and 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 can be able to operate at that game speed consistently it's it's a game changer for sure so last thing Dub, in, in looking at an approach to this. Um, obviously, I'm somebody who has read all your stuff. I've studied it. I, I had it, you know, implemented when I was actively coaching. I actually did, still did work to help quarterbacks I would work with on film um, preseason and during their seasons to understand 
space and timing better uh, utilizing some of this but uh, uh, the coach who's just getting started with this where do you recommend he he starts and you know maybe picks up capology now what does he do next yeah i think you know we have we have several you know places that they can go and, and that's the beauty of technology is it allows us to to all co- collect information faster and collaborate uh, so what we did is we developed an online platform, uh, r4footballsystem.com, and we have you know, a membership there that you have access to all our training tools and modules. So we take you step-by-step step on how um, we install this at our school. And also we, we pull you into community of coaches at all different levels that run entirely different offenses and that, that can show you how they've implemented it, how they use it. So I think that's one of the best things. I mean, we have you know, triple option teams. We have eight-man football. We have air raid. We have pro style and so I think, you know, uh, getting online and looking at the, at, at the materials we have to offer there, you can buy individual components of it, or you can become a member and get access to, to all of our teaching modules. There's probably over, you know, 80 plus modules there that take you step by step on how to implement this at whatever level you want. You know, some coaches just want it for the quarterback, um, R4 for the quarterback and the mechanics. Some want it for um, game planning and play calling and how they use it. Some want just the individual drills. Um, again, so we're constantly updating, doing webinars, and, and just it's a think tank for a lot of, of like-minded coaches, and I think that's probably where I would direct people to go to if they want a deeper dive after the books. And what's the best place to find the book? Yeah, so right now it's at our website, r4footballsystem.com. Um, we're just we're only selling through there. Actually, everything with COVID has, has pushed back all the publishing, so we were able to get a couple short-order runs. And so um, it won't be a sale on Amazon for another five weeks um, because of that back order with the mash um, printing um, of, of the order. So, again, right now, go to our website or for footballsystem.com, click on products, and it's right there. And we'll have it shipped to you and, and should we get there in two days. Well, Dub, I, I really you know, appreciate you taking the time. I, I love the work you do and uh, what, what you can do, and especially the people who study your stuff, what it can do to help them. Uh, win football games and uh, make make their programs better so thank you for all the time you put into it and you know we I guess the only you know thing looking at is I hope we don't have to have uh, another shutdown here for you to have some some more of these breakthroughs in uh, addition to things you're doing yeah no I, I agree with that I appreciate you having me on Keith it's great as always Thanks again for listening to the Coach and Coordinator podcast. Please check out all we're doing at coachandcoordinator.com. Got some great things coming for you in May and for the last three months or so of this offseason. We'll be back with All In on Offense and our deep dive on defense. And we have some great interviews with coaches as well as some quick casts that we'll throw in there. Check out all we're doing again at coachandcoordinator.com and follow me on Twitter at Coach K. Grabowski.